Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, all. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Rick Jackson, senior host and producer at IdeaStream. I'm very pleased to introduce today's forum, a conversation on the challenges and opportunities facing Cleveland's inner ring suburbs. Over the last several years, much of the conversation around Northeast Ohio's renaissance has focused either on the transformation of Cleveland's, Cleveland's urban core or new developments in the exurbs. The region's older inner ring or first suburbs frequently are left out of our conversations. Neither fully urban nor completely suburban, these areas, 20 of them all, do face unique challenges. Those include job and industry losses, declining tax bases, aging populations, and outmoded housing and commercial buildings. In the last decade, several suburbs have taken on the challenge of reinvention. But while facing expected trials, they soon discover they'd have to deal with the unexpected. Opioids, lead in paint and water, increasing mental health crises, and one we don't hear much about, unfunded pension liabilities that drain away dollars. But for the challenges that cities did see coming or dealt with expeditiously, there are some positives to report, and that's where we would like to focus this hour. This lopsided recovery for some of our suburbs was highlighted in a new study assembled by Frank Ford, <coughs> excuse me, in the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. It will spur much of the conversation we'll have today. We realize there are many more communities, ideas, and solutions than we could represent here on the panel or include in the next hour, but we will do our level best to cover a range of topics affecting all the entering suburbs, not just the cities featured here. So joining me on stage, who are these good folks? Ian Andrews, Executive Director of Lakewood Alive. Jerome Duvall, the Economic Development Director for the City of Warrensville Heights. Nick Fedor, the Executive Director of the Shaker Heights Development Corporation and Sally Martin, the Housing Director for the City of South Euclid. Would you welcome them all, please? <laughs> and we do know there is so much uniqueness, but at the same time, there's so much that is shared, and hopefully we can teach some things to, from some to others. One big problem that many suburbs do share is out-migration of population, so we'll start there. It may have slowed but it has certainly not stopped. I'll start with Nick, but anyone can join in with something in place or in mind that might stem the tide. Could you share with others? Sure, thank you, Rick. Um, so, you know, Shaker Heights is a, a fantastic community that was planned over 100 years ago as primarily a residential community. And we know that over that period of time, where people want to live and how they want to live has changed. And so that's certainly impacted the community in Shaker um, over the past, past decades. And so, you know, the city, to its credit, along with partners such as ours, is trying, are trying to kind of reinvent the community to stem that decline that you mentioned in terms of population by creating more uh, mixed-use opportunities, more, uh, more uh, different environments for people to live, different housing products, more commercial activities, more amenities that are walkable. Um, so not necessarily trying to imitate a, a more urban environment, but to add amenities, add the commercial tax base to draw new folks in and keep folks there. Ian, yeah, Lake was the most populous of these communities up here, and you've done a good job really keeping the folks you have there. How so? Well, we're certainly trying. So uh, Lakewood uh, on the near west side, um, we're a community of over 50,000 people in five and a half square miles. It's the most densely populated community between New York and Chicago, which is really kind of a fun fact. We have a lot of folks in a small space, uh, but uh, we had a peak population over 70,000 uh, years ago, and that has gone down. We're a completely built out city. So one of the factors, folks are having fewer kids. Uh, we still have the same housing stock that we had in the 1970s. Over 80% of our housing stock is 90 years or older, and we love our historic housing stock. But what we're trying to do is to make sure that we can attract folks uh, to move to Lakewood and, to Rick's point, keep them, uh, the ones who've lived there their entire lives, in Lakewood. And that's actually a really big challenge. Because we have this historic housing stock, we have folks who aren't necessarily able to age in place. And so many of our homes do not have first floor bedrooms. They don't have first floor bathrooms. But we have really great people who have spent their entire lives there in these homes that that's all they have known. And they've raised their families 
and they want to stay in this community. So the, one of the biggest challenges that we have is how can we support those folks to say, you've invested your entire life here. We want you to stay here. We don't want to lose you to another community to go and buy a ranch or somewhere else. Or if you don't have the upper mobility, where are you going to go? And so to be able to have those types of facilities available to folks is a really big challenge. Since you've taken us to housing, let's go there. Older stock infrastructure, that's a good start. Um, some owners, though, have no funds or negative equity to make the repairs and maintain the homes they would like to. Another huge problem, though, is the failure residents experience in securing loans to improve their homes. Bank loan officers prefer to focus on more profitable, more high-dollar sales. Sally, I know this is a battle South Euclid's been trying to wage. It is a battle that we've been waging uh, for some time, Rick. Um, in fact, we were one of the founding members of the Greater Cleveland Reinvestment Coalition and the purpose of that organization, we meet monthly here in the Greater Cleveland area to talk about bank lending, who's lending, who's not. Communities have essentially been redlined, so the whole east side of Cleveland, we can look at that Cleveland Crescent, you know, the familiar crescent of the foreclosure crisis. Those are the same areas that are not, they're not getting loans. So for mortgages under 50000 which some East side inner ring suburbs have a median value hovering around that space. Banks aren't willing to make those loans, so we want to call attention to that. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity right now in Cuyahoga County as they're renegotiating all of their banking relationships. So we feel very strongly that as municipalities and as a county, we need to place our money in institutions that are going to be meeting community credit needs. So we are, we're waging that um, plea. Talking with Jerome earlier, Warrensville Heights is just seeing a housing kind of a boom right now. And it's a good thing. You've got to share how this is working. Well, I can tell you that uh, Warrensville Heights, which represents 4.1 mile radius, about 13,500 population, we have done a tremendous job on our new housing stock um, with a, a little over 200 uh, new houses brought in our medium income right now for our housing value is setting right at um, 81,000. And I tell you how we did this was really um, by really assembling uh, land that was just unused land, mm -hmm. repurposing that land and developing that land. And I think this is key at an affordable price because one of the challenges that we have seen um, is the prices all over. Um, Sally talked about loans. <clears throat> Um, and red redlining. What we've had to do to combat our um, aging housing stock is put into place like exterior maintenance programs where we are out of the city general fund, we're putting 30,000 into that program with a two to three return um, where there's a investment of over 100,000 and trying to meet people where they are. And I think that that is critical, but our success really began probably eight years ago when the, the mayor took charge and really start laying the foundation in some of those institutional anchors. Mm -hmm. Different situation in Shaker Heights where you don't have land you can gather for big developments, but you have lots that you've split and areas where one house has been missing for a while that you've filled in. It's a different way of doing things. Sure, sure. Um, no, there certainly is opportunity for infill housing um, in the community. Shaker Heights is, is built out similar to these, these other communities and our, our population of about 28,000, there isn't a lot of room to, to spread out, so to speak, but there are those strategic opportunities to infill where, where there is. Would it work for everybody? I don't think it's a one-size-fit-all solution. It has to be responsive to community needs. Um, it has to be accessible, affordable, and equitable. A positive, or at least a different approach to restoration of the good old days has been the introduction of community development corporations. Not all the suburbs have them. You do. You work with one. Game changer? Absolutely. Um, you know, the commercial districts in Shaker Heights, there's only really two primary commercial districts. Um, one on the east side of the community where it's uh, Van Aken and Warrensville. There's been a great uh, new development and repurposing of that commercial district uh, by a private sector developer that's added new office, retail, and apartments. Um, on the west side of the city, uh, the Chagrin Lee area, 
um, a little bit different commercial market uh, where there's more professional services uh, and service-based businesses where really we see an opportunity uh, to really support the businesses that are in that area uh, and attract new ones to really build that commercial district and be responsive to community needs in that area of town. Mm -hmm. Sally, One South Euclid, uh, nonprofit citizens group represents neighborhood leaders about 10 years old now. Has it, it made a huge difference? It's made a tremendous impact. So one, one of the things South Euclid uh, was very fortunate to receive, um, and we won grant funds from HUD Neighborhood Stabilization Program back in 2008, 2009. We launched the Green Neighborhoods Initiative where we were uh, retrofitting bungalows to reinvent our housing stock. Because as we've all discussed today, uh, we have aging infrastructure, mm -hmm. aging housing stock, and that housing typology may no longer appeal to a modern buyer. So we worked with uh, designers from the Cleveland Institute of Art to reimagine what our bungalow housing stock would be. And also, demolition has provided a unique opportunity for us to do infill new housing. So we did it first with the Green Neighborhoods Initiative. We built two houses on 40-foot wide lots. We wanted to show what we could build sustainably and what we could build for under $150,000. Green built under $150,000. From us doing that, we've now gotten about 30 new units of housing in the city. So about $7 million of housing has developed since 2010. So overall, we've had $60 million of investment in our neighborhood since 2010, which is amazing. And the nonprofit helped take that work forward. So through the nonprofit's efforts, uh, we launched the Build, Grow, and Thrive residential resale program. Part of our rebranding of the city as, you know, come together and thrive in South Euclid, which um, we love as a tagline. Um, but what we did was um, we found opportunities with tax foreclosures, so properties would come back to the city's land bank. We were very aggressive about pursuing that on vacant and abandoned parcels. Uh, so as those properties would come to the city's land bank, there would be an option agreement issued to our nonprofit One South Euclid. So One South Euclid has done about seven million dollars of redevelopment of, of residential properties, either homes that have now been renovated and resold to owner occupants or land that has been resold for redevelopment. And as Jonice mentioned before, uh, that money is going right back into the community in the form of neighborhood grants for home repair, for senior snow plowing and grass cutting, um, and also for storefront renovations. So we've had $100 million of commercial reinvestment in little old South Euclid since 2010. So we're, we're a little city, but we're doing some pretty amazing things, and One South Euclid is our essential partner in that work. For the 16 inner rings who aren't up here today and who don't have a CDC, is that something you say they should look at sooner rather than later? Yes, I do. And I also think strategic partnerships such as what Mayor Blackwell is doing with Slavic Village uh, Redevelopment Corporation, they're running a program similar to ours in Maple. They don't yet have a CDC, but they're going to you know, be doing the same activities by collaborating with agencies that are already there. So if the city isn't inclined to start their own 501c3, I think there's many, many ways we can all work together. Rick, if I may, I think it was really insightful that in 2004, the city of Lakewood uh, and the Chamber of Commerce came together to form Lakewood Alive. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary. And initially, it was solely as an economic development organization focused on revitalizing our, our commercial corridor, specifically in downtown Lakewood on Detroit Avenue. But over time, our mission is to foster and sustain vibrant neighborhoods. And we want to do that citywide, but not just on the commercial side. And we've grown from just beyond downtown of helping small businesses throughout the entire community on our streetcar uh, suburb uh, uh, primary corridors of Madison and Detroit. But housing outreach, housing is the economic linchpin in Lakewood. It's critical that we maintain and sustain our, uh, our housing stock. We want to make sure that everyone lives in safe and affordable housing. So by having the nonprofit work with uh, between the city and the private sector to fill those gaps, that's where it becomes a really critical role we received support from the Cleveland Foundation years ago to get that program started. And then to be able to go to the banks, such as First Federal Lakewood, our friends from a Citizens Bank, to be able to go to the banks and say, invest in an organization that's investing in these neighborhoods to help people, particularly low to moderate income individuals. Uh, that has been a really key driver. And then being able to leverage our Housing Forward study briefly of evaluating every single one and two family home in Lakewood, almost 13,000 homes on a scale of one to four for code compliance, what you can see from the street. One, it's perfect. Two, weekends worth of work. Three, it's a big job. Four, it might be a demo. Mm -hmm. And by being able to then go to the folks who are those threes and fours and say, here's what we see, and we want to help you, that has been able to elevate 
uh, our game in Lakewood with our housing stock, get homes into good repair, and make sure people are living, most importantly, in healthy and safe living conditions. Good advice. Thank you. Jerome Duvall, Warrensville Heights, the Northeast Ohio's first suburbs development council, presenting the mayor's forum on workforce readiness. How critical do you feel increasing job opportunities in the suburbs are to strengthening the suburbs? Well, I think if you just look at what Amazon has done right in the Tri-City area with bringing over 26 to 3,000 some jobs um, has, tremendous, has given a tremendous boost to the entering suburbs. Um, I think the, one of the things though is the skill gap is what we're seeing and what we're hearing in the light manufacturing. Because we're a light manufacturing industry in Warrensville Heights, um, that is a real challenge for us and trying to be creative and figure out ways to combat that. We've uh, partnered with the county with their Skill Up program that really provides training and funding opportunities to businesses to help, cl to help close that training gap. So we've been working hard, but it is a real challenge for us. We're seeing the decline in population. That's real. Um, you know, for Warrensville Heights, our senior population makes up about 32% of our population. That's our very steady uh, population. That younger group is where we see their opportunity for growth. And as we look at housing, really trying to target millennials with some new housing we have coming online, which is literally a mile down the street from uh, the Amazon uh, Fulfillment Center. Question really for all of you. Um, this is leadership up here, and it's top down. How important is community buy-in to what you are advancing. I'll start with you, Ian. It's incredibly important. And um, while I'm the executive director, I'm simply just here representing everyone that we work with. I mean, we have so many folks from our board of directors and members of the community. Our housing and development operations director, Allison Organic, who's brought a tremendous amount of energy and uh, ideas to the organization. So uh, that's just my role is just a title. Uh, we are all on the same playing field, and we're all working uh, to pull the team together. It may sound cliche, but I honestly mm -hmm. believe that uh, in my heart of hearts that we have folks who they want to see things happen in Lakewood. One of the greatest things about Lakewood are the people. And it's one of, again, it's not to be cliche, and I do speak fast, I'm sorry, I get excited. <laughs> but a little passionate. Uh, the people of Lakewood care. They care about what happens in their neighborhood. Talk about all politics are local. People care about what's happening at the end of their street. They want to know that that development project, how is that going to benefit them, or how is it going to impact them, positively or negatively? And what's going to happen? And when we re when we put out the call for help, people raise their hands in Lakewood. And that it's so cool to see. It is so great to see that the people want to invest and work with their neighbors, some of whom they don't even know, and they're going to show up and they're going to help them out, be it a senior or otherwise. So to have the type of buy-in from the community that believes in what we as Lakewood Alive are doing, but really in partnership with all of the entities uh, in Lakewood, from the library to the Chamber of Commerce to Beck Center to the schools, everybody else. We're really seeing from the same songbook, trying to do the same thing, and people are buying in, and I think it's really exciting. Nick, let me go to you. Oh, I see you're about to jump in anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the whole idea of the Van Aken project, so much money going to one square of the city. Did everybody else say, yeah, let's do that? Yeah, no, I think just to you know, echo what Ian said perfectly was community input and um, that opportunity to be involved in the process and to have a voice is critically important to the work. And I think in terms of Shaker, we have no shortages of those voices who want to be involved. And, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the mayor is fond of, fond of saying that, you know, not everybody agrees on a lot of things in Shaker, but to your question, Rick, uh, Van Aken is one of those things that most people agree on, that it is, you know, accessible, welcome, welcoming. There's a lot of different options for people, both to eat, shop, and live. And it's been really viewed as a tremendous success here in the early stages. And that's some, some of the things we look to build on in other parts of the city. And I I think that's what's really exciting to people. Jerome, buy-in? Absolutely. Um, it actually starts with the community for us. Um, when you look at our org chart, it has residents, mayor, city council, and staff. So it starts with the community for us. And they're such a critical part of the voice of what we do in Warrensville Heights. Um, we're just going through a visioning project for a new development opportunity off Northfield. And it started with a small group of residents. And it's going to then build into a larger discussion about what people feel their needs are. And really 
um, making sure that everyone is heard from all corners of Warrensville Heights, not just the voting base, but also the, those individuals who might not be at, as affluent and may not be as engaged. We're inviting everyone to the table because we feel that everyone has a voice. Sally, you want to weigh in? I would say absolutely. Um, Mayor Wheelow is very committed um, to doing what we call, honestly, it's community organizing. And I honestly don't think too many cities over the years have done community organizing. We have found that we need to be in the community with the residents at events, um, forming block groups, getting people engaged, and we use an appreciative inquiry type process when we bring people together because we want to hear what they have to say. Um, and that's informed all of our work. It's informed starting our nonprofit. It's informed um, all of our master planning process. Uh, absolutely critical. And I, I would argue with Ian that we have maybe the best residents. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the best residents. So we Let's go to that point because it's interesting that three of you up here are contiguous cities. Right. So you do kind of have to deal with each other, work with each other all the time. How important is it that we have that give and take because what you're doing doesn't stop at the borders? Anybody can go first. Have, I think we have to stop looking at municipal borders. They're meaningless. Um, I think it's one community. And, and I believe many of us in first suburbs are extremely collaborative and we have that spirit. We want to help each other. Um, there's a, a new uh, nonprofit, well, you know, in, in Cleveland Heights, they've, they've sort of um, changed things around and, and created a community development corporation out of Future Heights. Uh, we've shared all of our documentation with them, all of the ways we do our property sales. You know, we don't believe in municipal boundaries. We don't think that's going to be sustainable. We think we all need to collaborate. And I think that the spirit is alive and well in the first suburbs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was just having coffee with the uh, mayor this morning, and we were talking about the mission, um, the mission of the people, right, and that we're servants of the people. Um, but, you know, one of the words I like to use is boundless collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to start looking at ourselves not as competitors, but as partners. And once we start doing that, and that's why the entering suburbs is so important around our success and what we're doing um, you know, with Ms. Kuzma sitting over there, raise your hand, um, and her leading the charge and really bringing us together. So I, for me, it's really about that collaboration, me being new, coming from D.C., Manhattan before that, not really being well connected. Mm -hmm. Well, those connections started with me picking up the phone, reaching out to my, my uh, constituents um, and my local partners to really ask, how do I do this? How have you been successful in doing this? I, you know, Storefront Grant, for example, I reached out to Lakewood Live. So there is a lot happening, but we are as strong as each other. And I think that, um, you know, my message to Cleveland, the county, the state, is that there is something happening in the inner league suburbs that I think that the collaboration um, is really based on really because of our success and our willingness to work together. Nick, you sit between two cities that you border. Is there a feeling of us against them, the, the Avons and the Solons of the world are different, and you guys kind of have to <laughs> band together to fight what they have? <laughs> Boy, is he turning red. Good, uh, <laughs> good try. Um, so I, I, I would just add that, you know, we have a great collaborative relationship with the communities that we border in the first ring. And I think from you know our perspective at SHDC, we look at the, the community and the districts, uh, the commercial districts we support, as Sally said, as, as kind of borderless. So looking at opportunities to partner with the city of Cleveland and community development corporations that serve the Lee Harbor, mm -hmm. Mount Pleasant, uh, and other communities that, that border us. I think that is really important in our work, and it's less about looking at what, you know, maybe a further flung community such as Avon or, or Solon has. Yeah, you all border Cleveland. I wanted to ask about that. Mm -hmm. How important is that that you do something with Cleveland? I think it's really important. 
Uh, we, so as an example, we have partnered with the Detroit Shoreway Community Development Organization where I used to work, uh, and Jeff Ramsey, I owe him a lot of credit uh, for helping me to understand this field, but we partnered with Detroit Shoreway to save two vacant and abandoned boarding houses years ago that were about a week away from demolition. The exploratory holes had been drilled, it was ready to go down, and we said, hold on, we're going to have these missing teeth, if you will, on these beautiful historic streets give us a chance to figure out, and this is what I was my plea to the city of Lakewood, give us a chance to save the home. Let's pull in a collaborative partner from the city of Cleveland. Who cares whether they're on the other side of 117th or not? That doesn't matter. They have the expertise. We will work our tails off to get people through. And so my colleague and I, Allison, we took people through those homes during the polar vortex of the winter of 14 without any heat or any electricity. We're shoveling the sidewalks. I mean, these were our babies where we're trying to sell these things. And we were able to save them, and they were able to be restored, and now they have families living in them, and so that represented a half a million dollars of investment. The point of that is we should be more than just the municipal boundaries, but there's also other nonprofits in town mm -hmm. who may have traditionally served in the city of Cleveland who we're, we're all now working with, with NHS, CHN, ESOP, mm -hmm. all of these acronyms, uh, excuse that, uh, to be able to say, our resident in Burtown has a furnace that's barely operable. We can then turn to Cleveland Housing Network and, and go through their weatherization program to put in a furnace that's gonna work to make sure they have heat in the winter. I mean, how about that for a novel concept? Let's have heat. So these are important programs that we need to be able to leverage and having a nonprofit in the community that can play that role in between public private sector and work with those other organizations, I think that's a really critical role that we play. There was a suggestion that programs that are working, such as the Key Bank Challenge Home Repair Loan Program in Cleveland Heights, should be expanded to more communities, more neighborhoods. Any of you actively seeking options like that to expand into your communities? Uh, if I may, uh, yeah. we have launched uh, the Pride Fund, uh, and this is we we have folks have pride in their homes. They love where they live. They love the streets that they live on. But you know what? Sometimes you uh, you've hit upon a hard stretch, and you make just enough money that you can't get any help from a government loan, but you make. You make too much, but you can't, but you either don't make enough, you're in bankruptcy, lack of equity, credit score, whatever it might be, and you're not bankable. But you still have a serious problem with your house. Your porch is falling off. You've got a hole in the roof. You have a lead on the interior of a home, and there's a serious abatement issue. And so what we've been able to do in partnership with the city is to go out and privately raise money, which the city has then matched, to then say, we will guarantee a loan up to $8,500, $10,000 to residents to say, we believe in you. We know you, we've gone through budget uh, and credit counseling, we know that you're going to see this through, but for this la loan of last resort, this job would not get done, and you're either gonna be cited by the city or you're gonna have a serious health and safety issue in your home. So then they go through our uh, conventional uh, a mortgage, I'm sorry, a loan with uh, First Federal Lakewood, our uh, lending partner. What we're doing with that money is we're guaranteeing that the resident's gonna pay it back. We stretch it out over 60 months, we make sure it's a reasonable term. We're believing in that resident to make that investment, to bring their home up to good repair, and then we'll move on to the next homeowner. And I, I, I just would add um, that we have been attempting to get a similar fund in South Euclid for a number of years, and we've worked with the Home Repair Resource Center that's been doing this in mm -hmm. Cleveland Heights for about 50 years and has an extremely low default rate. Uh, what we're, we're sort of beating the drum at the county about is that we'd like to see this be a county-wide program and there are three banks mm. uh, that really need to rise to the occasion right now who have community benefits agreements key bank huntington bank and fifth third have a very big opportunity here and we've spoken to key about this as well um, key is the underwriter for the for the cleveland right. heights program there needs to be some seed money and a bank willing to do it but we feel this is absolutely critical uh, just the other night, we, we had a rollout. Uh, we have we were back in the um, the Heritage Home Loan Program through the Cleveland Restoration Society, and I was expecting maybe 15 people to come to the informational night. The line was out the door. There was no room. They had to move another group out of another part of the library to open the wall to allow everybody to come into the room. That tells us there is a tremendous amount of pent up demand in the suburbs for home repair. And this is a priority in the county's housing plan as well for home repair lending. So I think it's a way we can collaborate as a region and do something broader for everyone. Okay. I'm going to take moderator's privilege and push the clock for a second here because I know we're about time for Q&A, so get your questions ready. There's one subject we haven't touched on, and that's schools. And let me start with a big plus here. Warrensville Heights marked the recent report card released with glee. The only system in the state to jump from F to C in just two years. <laughs> now, 
That said, how important, look at him beam. <laughs> how important is the school system and what you're trying to do to make people look at the city differently, to bring people into the city, to bring business into the city? Absolutely. Um, perception. Perception matters, right? But there's three things people think about when they move into a community. School is on the top of that list. And Superintendent Jolly, the school board, the mayor, the city council has worked together and really supporting that mission. And, you know, when I heard that we had just did something that has never been done, I don't think in the state of Ohio or anywhere else, you know, it is time for us to tell our story. It is time for us to brag just a little bit about the success that we're having. You know, we're building a brand new facilities across the city, pre-K to fifth grade, uh, middle school and high school. Oh, by the way, the pre-K to fifth grade, the school funded it out of its own budget. So they didn't go for a levy, but we did have to go for a levy for the middle school and high school, right? Passed at 77%, the highest ever. So when we talk about community, when we talk about collaboration and partnership, we're doing it. We're doing it in Warrensville Heights, but we could not do it if we were not working together. So that's $110 million uh, new development uh, of facilities across Warrensville Heights. So I just want to thank the school, the school board, the mayor, the city council. Uh, the mayor had a very um, aggressive vision uh, when I came on four years ago. We're starting to live that vision today. And I just want to say, thank them for all the work that they've done. And they get the credit. Yeah. Yeah. If I may, so um, Lakewood has uh, really strong schools, both uh, public and private. And it's one of the primary reasons why you said people want to live in Lakewood. At the high school, there's over 30 different languages spoken at Lakewood High School. I mean, think about that, 30 languages. That is incredible that we are such a melting pot of a community. We're second in terms of the number of refugees resettling uh, in the Cleveland market, only to the uh, Clark Fulton neighborhood in Cleveland. <laughs> And so we have a lot of folks who are moving here because they want to send their kids to really high-performing schools. What's also really cool, fun fact you may not know, we don't have any busing. Our kids walk to school. We have neighborhood-based schools and everybody walks. We are a walkable community, not just for shoppers, but for all of our schools. And so the school district, and then the fact that the citizens and the residents of Lakewood, they see a school levy and they ask tough questions and they pass a levy. And we've passed several levies that have allowed for all the buildings to either be built new or uh, rehabbed uh, and restored to a, a tremendous greatness. And so our school district, I think, is one of the things that we really should really hold up, along with our parks, as one of the primary drivers of why people want to live in Lakewood. Short brag. Go ahead. <laughs> so absolutely, the schools are critically important, and they've been important to Shaker for the community's existence. Um, it's one of only a small handful of international baccalaureate accredited programs uh, in, the, in the state. Um, we have walkable schools as well. We do have buses too, but we have neighborhood walkable schools. Um, the, the community has really never seen a levy it didn't ask tough questions on, but didn't like. It, it has a remarkable history for passing levies and investing in schools, and that will continue, I think, and continue to attract new residents. And Sally, I guess my question is, do cities pump their schools first to get people to pay attention to everything else? Well, I have a little bit of a different take on this, um, and I think we perhaps spoke before. I started a blog, the SELExperienceProject.com. Why did I start the blog? Our schools went from 80% white to 80% black in 14 years. And the white flight from our schools does not mirror the population of either community in which they serve. Our communities are not majority minority, yet our schools are. Why is that? Um, I wanted to dig into that a little bit more because I think it's a true uh, perception issue. And having talked to realtors and gathering realtors uh, in South Euclid every year for a half day to talk about what's on their minds and what's going on with property sales, school perception was viewed as very negative. Um, I was told when I moved to South Euclid in 2001, don't use the schools. You're going to have to send your kids to private school. And I didn't dig into that until my son was getting ready to go to high school and he wanted to go to Brush High School. And my husband and I were thinking, well, why? You know, we've been sending to private school. We hear terrible things. 
about the public high school. Well, he went, he excelled, he loved it, and I learned something. And the mayor's children also went to, to the SEL schools. You know, so we knew the schools, we found firsthand the schools are great. The schools are amazing, they really are, but there's more to it than that. Um, in doing the project, which is a storytelling project, um, I wrote an essay called The Problem No One Talks About, and I called Mayor Wheelow and I said, are you sure it's safe to put this out online? <laughs> and she said, go for it. You know, we have to start talking about these things. Uh, so we did, and it was uh, widely shared, and it became strangely uh, popular outside of our school district. Uh, but we started telling stories of people who have graduated from school, and by and large, almost without fail, they tend to go into a social justice type profession. Mm -hmm. So they're not going into investment banking, but if they're becoming a physician, they're working with underserved mm -hmm. populations, it's uncanny how many of those kids, and it's because of the diverse environment they've grown up in, they want to make the world a more just and equitable place. And to me, that is the argument for our school district. If you want the world to be better, send your kids to a diverse school district. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wrap it up. Mm -hmm. So Rick, while we're bragging, I just want to brag on a little bit more. Um, you know, so with the new facility plan that's being rolled out, um, the, the pre-K to fifth grade will be completed um, by October of uh, 20. But we've already ran into a challenge. We now have over 480 to 500 kids coming back to Warrensville Heights, right? And so, but that, that creates another challenge, right? Capacity, right? And so right now we're thinking about having to expand the existing schools that we're already building. And so it's a good problem to have, um, but I just wanna um, talk about some of the great work. And I'm gonna tell you, the reason why this is happening is because of good governance. No one wants to talk about governance in a predominantly black community, 98% black, and when you talk about diversity, you're absolutely right. You know, when I look at my kids and where they're going to school and their community service and how they're moving off on to college. Um, so diversity is important, but let me tell you, perception becomes reality even if it's, even if it's not based in truth. Perception becomes reality, even if it's not based in truth. We have always had a perception problem in Warrensville Heights. But guess what? We have done, right, 12% increase in commercial industrial. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking about the 12%, 13% increase in housing value. So what I'm saying is, don't believe Jerome. Log on to our podcast. Believe the people who are investing in our community. Believe the people who have worked there for 25 and 30 years, who have lived there, have roots in our community. Log on and listen to them tell that story. And I, I, have, I, I think you will agree with me that if you're not excited about Warrensville Heights, because once those schools go down, it creates a whole new opportunity another 25 acres of redevelopment opportunity exists because we're moving from three school, eight schools down to three schools, right? So it creates a whole nother opportunity. Schools are so important and critical to any community as you think about building that community up and moving it forward. And I'm all for future forum right there. We need to talk schools more so. Thank you all. <laughs> Today we're listening to a forum on the challenges and opportunities facing Cleveland's inner ring suburbs featuring Ian Andrews, Executive Director of Lakewood Alive, Jerome Duvall, Economic Development Director for the City of Warrensville Heights, Nick Fedor, the Executive Director of the Shaker Heights Development Corp, and Sally Martin, Housing Director for the City of South Euclid. We're about to begin the audience question and answer segment. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, tweet it at the City Club and our staff will try and work it into the program. Holding the microphones today, content coordinator Bliss Davis, City Club intern Rima or Sonia. May we have the first question, please? Great, great program and <clears throat> great job by all of you. Uh, and thanks for being here today. 
the first inner ring suburb, and once upon a time, in my memory, the greatest inner ring suburb uh, was East Cleveland, which hasn't been <laughs> whispered today. And uh, I guess I'm just interested in your thoughts. I mean, we could have a whole uh, program on East Cleveland, but it is fair to say arguably the most distressed, depressed, the inner ring suburbs now. And nobody talks about it. And I, so I guess I'm just curious uh, what any of you sort of maybe have learned from the East Cleveland experience. And, and I loved your point about how we're only as strong as our weakest link as a community. Uh, and we're one community. So with that in mind, I guess my question is, what are, you, what are you all thinking of what we can do, should do, for East Cleveland? Uh, I know they had a failed attempt to merge with the city of Cleveland. Maybe that is, is an answer still. I don't know. But I'm just interested in your thoughts on what you've learned from East Cleveland, what, what you would like to see us do for East Cleveland. It's kind of interesting, too. I know that um, I think Shaker Heights is involved, Cleveland Heights, University Heights, South Euclid, that do assist East Cleveland in some aspects. Uh, we, we were doing mutual aid with them, for sure, when they had a couple squads go down and, and we all needed to step up. Um, I think demolition funding, there is a matter on the, the state's budget where it would provide an additional $50 million of demolition for the state. Hopefully that number will go up. I think they have not finished the demolition job that they need to do, but you can see that where they touch uh, more vibrant parts of the community, those areas are coming up, and I think um, they've worked very, very hard at uh, doing as much revitalization as they could do, but demo funds are running out at the county, and I think that's a critical, critical issue for them. So hopefully everyone will be supportive of that matter at the state, at the state house right now. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I can't necessarily speak uh, specifically uh, to East Cleveland. What impacts all of our communities is the way in which state government has rated the local government fund. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that has taken away so many, so many resources from our communities. And while the governor uh, has recently uh, provided uh, some uh, funding back into that uh, pot, to take that away, to then ask the cities to do even more with even less, is a disservice to all of us, especially folks who preach home rule and preach small government, but then you talk about big government overreach and putting their hand in that cookie jar. So I would encourage everyone to, uh, we need to get those funds back. They need to come back to the communities in which they are beginning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question where? There you are. Um, Right now, uh, outside on Public Square, there's the climate strike demonstration where a lot of young people are asking us to please stop burning fossil fuels so that they'll have a world that they can live in instead of doing Hunger Games type things. Um, <laughs> and the question that I have is, um, you know, many of your communities were built around public transit uh, or benefit from it even today, what are you doing to get people out of their cars? Are you, you know, are you asking the reps, the suburban reps on the RTA board for more local funding? Are you building protected bike lanes? Are you investing in transit-oriented development? What are you doing to help address that crisis? Okay, if I, so, I, oh, I'm sorry, else, I know we're, we're else, all so. loving transit, right? right. And uh, <laughs> Mayor Wheelow is on the RTA board. Um, we have a, a complete streets plan that we've been working with NOACA for, with our neighboring communities, a TLCI grant. Uh, we need funding for that, however. And unfortunately, in the state of Ohio, getting Department of Transportation yeah. funds yeah. is a bit of a trick for us. But um, I think by their own nature, entering suburbs are inherently sustainable. They are the inherently sustainable choice for living. You have access to transit. You have true walkability to amenities. Um, it, it is our strength. It is our best selling strength. And I think um, we are wise to help refurbish our core and build on those strengths. Yeah, I would just add to that that in Shaker, uh, transit and multimodal options are extremely important, and especially in our commercial districts. Uh, where we're well served by two fixed rail lines. And the, the businesses and development that we are trying to incentivize and, and, and promote in those commercial districts all focus on less on the car and more on people getting to those places either by foot, uh, by bike, or transit. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is something that the Shaker Heights Development Corporation is really advocating for and, and promoting in the community. So the bus must stop at the Warrensville line because that is one of our challenges, I think, mm -hmm. is that we have to 
And this is my call to action to RTA. We have to do a better job with transportation and connecting communities because the majority of the people in our community, 40% of them, do not drive. And so it's a challenge for us. So I'm not gonna sit here and paint a pretty picture. I'm gonna say, for some reason, you know, the bus must stop at the Warrensville border. Um, we need to connect yeah. the two. We're sitting right next to Van Aken, right in between um, Pine Crest, and there is over 3,000 jobs sitting right on the corner, right? They did bring a bus line in there, but that was after taking away a bus line. And so we have to do a better job. And I, you know, I think that you know, we're getting ready. If you haven't heard, I'm gonna make the big announcement. You only heard it here at the Cleveland, uh, <laughs> Cleveland Club. We're getting ready to move City Hall. Uh, um, you know, I wanna give a shout out to Mayor Sellers for having the vision, right? Um, we had a 40,000 square foot building that was vacant in our community. And now through good governance, remember I talked about good governance, without having to go to uh, the businesses or the taxpayers to put a levy on, we've been able to uh, ink a deal where we'll be moving uh, into a brand new Class A building, uh, City Hall, um, and uh, we don't have a bus stop there. We're gonna need a bus stop there because the mission and the vision of the mayor was really to bring coordinated services, right? And we've invited the school to be a part of that discussion. So when I talk about the collaboration and the balanced collaboration um, that needs to happen in order for us to be successful, that's what I'm talking about. I do you didn't something. tell them Richmond Road south of Emory. <laughs> Uh, is, that's the location, uh, Richmond Road, south of Emory. Um, he's done his homework. Uh, it's the old South University building. Um, yep, so good job. So, Ian? Mayor. So in Lakewood, uh, we have three parallel bus lines, 55, the 26, the 25, and then the 80, uh, and one runs uh, north-south, or um, 83, sorry. And the, the 55 and the 26, they serve uh, consumers, I think, quite well. But uh, particularly in our Birdtown neighborhood, which is a proud, historic, uh, manufacturing-based neighborhood where 40% of the residents don't have access to a car, the bus run one, runs once an hour. And on the weekends, uh, it's even more infrequent. And so what happens if you're late to the bus stop and you miss it by two or three minutes? You gotta wait another hour. And we actually ran and we looked at it in, our, in partnership, uh, a grant that we were able to uh, go after as a CDC in partnership with Citizens Charter One at the time and we say we want to better connect people to the red line. The red line at 117th and Madison, that is our, our red line stop, if you will, even though it's on the other side of the line. And we looked, and for about a 40 block run, there wasn't one single protected shelter. Well, that's a problem. And so we went and we were able to get a grant to put in a bus shelter, something that you think would be simple and easy to do, but it's not. Oh, and not so fun fact, a bench is a separate cost. So if you want to give people a place to sit, it costs more money. So we've now been able to work uh, with our partners and with our friends at RTA to now put in, we're putting in our third, I'm sorry, our fourth uh, bus shelter through in, uh, a, a transit waiting environment program, working with Cuyahoga County, public art, adding green space, but also saying we need to improve our transit connections. But beyond providing the facilities, we as a state do a terrible job of funding public transportation. Indiana's mm -hmm. killing us at, at funding public transportation per capita, Indiana. We're missing the boat in Ohio. No offense, Indiana, sorry, but. Wow, that was pointed. Like, come on. Like, come on, We've got to, we, we need to do a better job. And if we need to be able to connect people and help them get to jobs, then let's take transportation seriously. I, the, the work of Vibrant Neo can't just sit on a shelf. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs to be said. Um, the mayor and I have met with Hunter Morris numerous times, and that's critical work for this region. To get back to the theme of why we're all here today, can others learn from what Lakewood has done with RTA from the research you've done? Can they just come to you and say, hey, help us out here? Uh, I would love to be able to help as best we can. I think that they, they hopefully can learn and can see that when you have a city government uh, working with a nonprofit partner and a government, governmental entity and the private sector, and you pull all of these groups together to go after projects, whether it's transit waiting environments where you're improving the conditions for people who ride public transportation to bike lanes, to even something completely unrelated, but looking at housing and how we analyze our entire housing stock of almost 13,000 one and two family units. 
That's a big undertaking, but that's a big reason why we've seen a lot of success. We've had folks now investing in their homes or coming to Lakewood Alive or our partners saying, we need help and we're not sure what to do and we don't have the funds to do it. So we're now able to at least try to connect them to those resources. However, on the flip side, I will say it's a double-edged sword. We also have to keep affordable housing in mind. It's not all rainbows and sunshine as housing prices go up. We need to make sure the people who live in Lakewood and all of our communities can stay in those communities and that we're accessible to people who want to move into our communities. Deep dive off one question. Thank you for that, sir. Next. Many of our entering suburbs um, have had retail centers that have struggled. So Shaker, the old Van Aken district, felt like it had become very stagnated. Um, Randall Park Mall, it died. Uh, Severance Town Center is dying. So for those of you who have done retail center redevelopment, what has been your thought process in determining what businesses, what retailers to attract? And then what was the timeline or the time frame from planning to completion? Let's start with Sally, because I guess you've got the Marks Plaza on Mayfield there that yes. just came through a renovation. That was just renovated also, Cedar Center North, which uh, had become extremely blighted, full of rats. It was horrible. The city actually had to intervene and ended up buying that real estate and then having to work with developers and it was a big risk for us but it did pay off and obviously that area is very vibrant today and, and it borders University Heights and they have Cedar Center South. Um, I think a city has a role to play but a city doesn't have all the control. Um, you know we're very jealous of the Van Aken district because they there was one owner I think and it was very easy to work with. Uh, with the, the whole Marks Plaza we had about seven, eight different owners over there. So deals like that are not easy to pull together, and nor can we handpick the retail mix that we're getting. It's based on the zoning for that area. But South Euclid is looking at form-based code. So much like many other cities, you know, we are exploring form-based code as a way to create uses that we're, you know, we want to see in an area. Nick? Yeah, I would just add to that that you know, the, the retail market is, is fast evolving and, and constantly changing and the types of businesses that residents want to frequent whether that's walking to driving to taking a train to uh, is ever changing and I think there are a number of dynamics that go to go into that ownership is certainly one of those um, being able to bring locally owned and independently operated businesses to a community is important um, I think for all of our communities and in, in the broader region um, bringing concepts that are new to market that may be regional is, is important but having a unique flavor and an uh, authentic flavor, I think, is, is critically important to differentiating uh, from some of the larger um, big box centers. I can tell you um, our strategy has been to acquire, clear, and hold. Hold until you have a plan. And I think that that's where most of us fall short is good planning. Um, and so... What we've been doing is really starting a visioning process. We have on Northfield, right next to the new uh, school campus that's going to be built. We have about uh, 25 acres of contiguous land there. Um, and part of the challenge is multiple owners. Um, but we have slowly, over the past six, seven years, have acquired that land, and now we're looking at planning, but I'm gonna tell you one of the biggest challenges is infrastructure, infrastructure costs. So my, I've had a lot of um, call to action this evening. Uh, my other call to action is to the county, um, to say to the county that we need infrastructure funding to support the local communities in terms of being able to make deals work. We're sitting in an opportunity zone, right? So 90% of our city sits in an opportunity zone. And the opportunities that I'm talking about today all sits in an opportunity zone. And so we can leverage that, but we need support in that collaboration. I would say there's one project happening in Lakewood uh, where the city did step in. Uh, and so as a small CDC, I mean, we're a staff of five. We have a, a tiny budget. We're not developing properties uh, per se. But the city was able to step in when a developer came in and said, there's a beautiful church. Uh, an adjacent commercial space and a parking lot. We want to tear it down, put in a drive through fast food restaurant. And it would have been a loss. And I applaud the city for stepping in and saying, 
that we, and there, there was a, a legal way for them to do so based on uh, drive-through uh, ordinance that we have. You can only stack so many cars. And I applauded mm -hmm. them for having that in place because then the company said reasonably we would not be able to meet that threshold. So the city then stepped in, purchased the property, and then to be able to put out the RFP to developers to say, what will you do with this property? You need to have a plan. Absolutely. And we will uh, look favorably upon historic preservation, which we appreciate deeply in Lakewood. And so to be able to secure the site, to have the control, to then move forward with something that is going to, we hope, uh, incorporate historic preservation, that's a big deal. We will have to leave it there. The state, the county, RTA, all on notice today. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> the community partner for today's forum, One South Euclid. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Citizens Bank, the City of Cleveland Heights, the Cleveland Clinic, First Suburbs Consortium members, the NRP Group, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and Ohio Guidestone. Finally, we welcome students from Shaker Heights High School. Support for student participation in City Club forums comes from the William M. Weiss Foundation with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We're happy to have you all here. That brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, Mr. Duvall, Mr. Fedor, and Ms. Martin. Special thanks to our City Club members whose financial support makes our work possible. To find out more about upcoming forums and how you can support the City Club, visit us online at cityclub.org. This forum is now adjourned. Go to cityclub.org. <laughs>